Welcome to Punch Keys Podcast. I'm Poppy Minix, your co-host, bringing you blunt talk for the fiction novelist. And I'm Cass Kay, your other writerly co-host. If you love to ramble about writing and need a tribe, you found us. Are you ready? We're uncorking now. Let's talk about punching those keys. Welcome to Punch Keys. You found us. Hey, Poppy dear. How's it going? Well, hello. Good morning. It's a morning today. I know we're doing a morning session. What? Yes. Yes. Coming to you early this morning with lots of coffee to talk to you about critiques. Critiques. Oh, no. And yay. I think there's two (laughs) sides to it. I think some people who have had critiques can get a little like, oh, no. Because it means you're going to have work to do, which is, it's a phase of editing. Yes. And then some people, I think, too, are just excited because you get so excited to have someone read your stuff and give you your feed, their feedback on it. And even though there's work to do, um, a good critiquer is also going to tell you all the stuff you're doing right. And yes. that's always really fun to hear. Yes. So critiques. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to think of... I mean, because we've always we've talked about this already, or I don't know if we have or haven't, but um, you can't count when your friends or family read your stuff as a critique. It doesn't count, guys. <laughs> it does. I love that they're supporting you. That's super awesome. Um, that's not a critique uh, because they have to see you after they tell you what they think about it. And there's a level of honesty that goes away in that. Yes. So um, that means the writer tribe we've talked about before, going online and meeting other writers, is how you're going to find your best critiques because they don't know you personally and they are only looking at your writing as your writing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's then that's where there's that double-edged sword because it's scary because sometimes they're going to nail you on some stuff. Um, yes. But it's also super even more satisfying and rewarding when someone like that who's not personally connected to you and not invested in you being in a good mood um, likes your stuff or they like parts of your stuff. Um, yes, absolutely. And that's another thing too. They're going to like parts of it. And there's different styles of critiques. Mm-hmm. So, oh my and, goodness. And when you're going onto a critique site – You are literally putting your stuff out there to be critiqued. In other words, it's not so that people will think it's great. You're not putting out there so everyone will think it's perfect. You're putting it out there and people are looking for issues with your work. They are not there to just read and be like, yay. They're there to be like, what do I need to pick apart? Because I'm also a writer and I also want critiques. And we all need to learn from each other. So it's really important for honest feedback and to be ready for that feedback as well. That made me think of two things you're doing critiques. One, I think some people go in with critiques as, okay, I fixed all these things and now I'm going to put it back up for critique and I'm going to do that and now everyone's going to tell me it's great and it's ready to publish. Yeah. That's never going to happen no. um, for several reasons. It has nothing to do with it not being ready to publish. You might be ready to send it out to agents, to query it, to send it out to magazines, to whatever you're doing. Um, but what it does mean is – And this is something to look at when you get critiques, too. All authors have different styles, different opinions, different approaches. And so there's always going to be an author that's going to find something they would change in your writing. Mm -hmm. So you're never going to get the, oh, this is done and ready. Um, There's all these different ways to critique. Mm -hmm. There is all these different styles of writing. Yes. So, Poppy, do you have, like, a checklist of what you need to make – like a good critique partner that fits for you. Is there certain things you look for? Um, y- yes, but sometimes that doesn't match other people's. I think everybody sort of looks for what works for them and what doesn't. Um, I really like people. I, at this point in my critiquing writing career. Okay, start uh, with when you first started. When I first started, I needed everything. And when I first started, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know what a conjunction was. I didn't know POV. I was just like, well, uh, this person's talking, so I must be in their head now. It was a mess. Um, So I needed people to tell me generally, you know, ah, you need one POV here. This doesn't make sense. You just switch. You just jumped out of body and jumped into somebody else. And I go, oh, I didn't even know you didn't that, that you couldn't do that. And so I learned so much from people critiquing over really big, huge things that I just didn't know you couldn't do. 
when you were writing. And so that helped a lot. Um, I also had a full book that I had completely written before I started critiques. And I'm super glad that I did. Um, it can be very, very difficult when you're first starting out writing and you have written three chapters. And I've heard this a lot on our writing forums. Um, when people jump in and when they're first starting to look for critiques, they're like, I have three chapters and they are awesome. And so I'm going to find out what people think of these three chapters. I'm going to write the rest of the book. And then other writers don't like their three chapters and then they disappear and never come back again. And that makes me really sad. Um, that just, it depends on where you are in your writing career as to when you are able to take critiques and, not be so horribly offended that you walk away from it because stuff is going to be incorrect in your work. Um, so for me, I wanted everything. I wanted, I, I had had my entire novel out. Um, I just wrote it. Uh, I got dinged on certain things, again, POV, on conjunctions, on dialogue was super stiff and unneeded in certain areas because it was like, hello, why, hello, how are you today? <laughs> well, I am fine. And you? And it's like, nobody wants to hear that in dialogue. I mean, every beginner writer is like, uh, of course you would say hi. Why wouldn't they say hi, you know? Um, and so I needed everything uh, when I first started out because I knew absolutely nothing. I had not taken creative write writing classes. I do not have an English background. I just started writing and, and that was that. And it hurt, but at the same time, I think I was ready for it because I... And very open for critique. I'm very open, you know, if you tell me something's wrong, I'm not going to be like, oh, oh, well, oh. I'm going to be like, <laughs> oh, it is? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I will totally fix that because that's just me. That's my personality. Um, if you get horribly offended when somebody tells you, if your first initial reaction when somebody tells you that you've done something wrong is to just spit and run away, you might not be ready yet and you need to prepare yourself for critiques because critiques do need to happen. It is really, really important process of publication is that other people read your work and can help you tweak it to where it needs to be. There is an interesting thing that I have seen um, with, because I've done lots of critiques on people and there's been a learning curve for me on how to critique. Oh, we'll have to get into that in a minute too. <laughs> yes. Um, but I have seen people who are the opposite. They're not hugely offended Mm -hmm. they automatically assume the critiquer doesn't know what they're talking about. Right. And so I think there's a happy medium in this. Um, because assuming that you're brilliant and no one else gets it and they're dumb is not the answer. And running away and never writing again is also not the answer. And I'm going to add to that. Another not answer is to take every single thing that somebody says for the truth and, and change your entire work because that person didn't like your stuff. So, and I think there's a way to help with all of these, and that is finding the right type of critiquers. Mm -hmm. And so certain ways to do that. One is be really aware of genre. Um, if you are writing a horror and you have a contemporary romance writer come in and critique your work, I've had this happen. Mm -hmm. They're going to push and pull for every description of a guy who walks on, if you have a female point of view, to be attractive and alluring and they're going to get together. Right. And they're <laughs> going to not like – this is stuff I've had. They're not going to like your female point of view because she's not attracted to anyone. She's like defensive and resistant because she's in a horror setting and she's not – Not you know, interested and, in the smoochy face at the moment. No, yeah. And it's – there's nothing wrong in the critique. There's nothing wrong in the writing, but it's certain readers have certain expectations. Yes. And although you're a writer, you're a writer for a particular genre and you understand the tropes and the expectations of that genre. So yes. if you go and critique a genre you don't read or write and you start offering, I want to see this, I want this, that's going to, I tend to not put a lot of stock into those ones. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, that's not really how this genre works. I That's super cute. I love it. Thank you. But they will also come in and that same critiquer who is looking for smoochy, those little kissy faces everywhere, they're also going to be like, hey, your sentence would look better if it was swapped this way. Or, hey, I was confused. I didn't understand how the magic works this way here. Um, and so it's not 
uh, all or nothing with critiques. Mm -hmm. There can be some things that you can look at and be like, okay, I know that's probably not quite right because that's not the genre. I think genre is the big way to find out. And then there are things that are like, oh, if you're not understanding this, I need to go in and lay in some more groundwork beforehand so this scene makes sense more. Yes. Um, My favorite quote of all, and Poppy's heard me say this a bazillion times, is Neil Gaiman. Um, And he um, he talked about critiquing, and he said, if someone tells you something's wrong with your writing, they're almost always right. If someone tells you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. Yes. And so people who come in and rewrite your stuff for you, they're like, oh, this feels a little awkward. Here, what if you wrote it like this? And then they give you... Sometimes it's just a sentence. Sometimes it's a paragraph. Sometimes it's every other paragraph. Yes. And that is, I kind of just. That's not for a critiquer to do. That's for an no. editor to do, potentially, but they probably won't because they liked your writing and would love to pick it up. So you're going to yeah. completely lose your, the, your voice, your authorial voice, yeah. if you do that. Um, and so when someone does that to me, I just kind of. And I always, I always think someone who critiques me. I always find something useful out of every single critique I get. Mm-hmm. Um, but when someone rewrites my stuff, I'm like, oh, okay. So this section didn't work for them. I don't even look at how they rewrote it because I'm not going to take someone else's writing and put it under my name. And so I just like yes. mark that section as, okay, they felt this was stilted or awkward. And it goes back to that Neil Gaiman quote. Something's probably wrong with that section. I don't need to listen to how they told me to fix it, but now I know it's marked. So I've gained something from that critique, even if they have completely tried to write my work for me. I will, I mean, I am, we all do things great and we all do things wrong. (laughs) You know, it's a learning process for critiquing. Um, There are going to be things that you don't always do correct, or you're going to tell them something possibly wrong, learn from it, keep going. Um, For me, I will occasionally give examples, but I'll also note that it is an example. Like, hey, you have passive voice here. And if there's passive voice everywhere, clearly this person just doesn't know how to fix passive voice. And so I will rewrite a sentence to say, like, this is how you change passive voice into active. Um, See, what I'll do in that scenario is I'll go and find one of my favorite articles on passive voice. And I'll be like, hey, this is passive oh, voice. Idea. And I'll put a link to the article there. Be like, check this out for ways how to fix it. Smart. Um, I do that a lot. So, like, I just got done. And I've switched from critiquing to beta reading, um, yes. which is a little bit different because the beta reading, you don't do line edits. So there's different types of editing. There's development editing. There's mm-hmm. line editing. Is there? A, there's a third one. What's the third one? Uh, consistency editing, um, copy editing. There's all kinds of different types uh, that you go through. Um, And so I tend to do, I I don't like the line editing um, because I'm not good with SPAG. I'm just not great at it. Like I can, I need an editor to help me with it. My commas are probably right 70% of the time, 30% of the time they're wrong. Um, I just sometimes have little blip bloops and misses miss stuff in my spag and so for me to go in and critique that on someone else I'm like oh geez that's not happening so instead I look at the bigger broader picture and I do beta reads which means I read a full novel from beginning to end yeah and then I'll look at stuff like passive voice or like literary devices or if I can feel development yeah if I can feel something's off Mm -hmm. I like to go and find out why with a source besides me yeah and it sounds like a lot of work but I understand why it's wrong and then I can usually find something in my own writing that I'm doing that I'm like oh I do that too oh and this is where there's so much beauty in critiquing if you do it right because you learn just as much doing it as you do receiving it exactly so I could be like just spout out how I would write it or whatever. But instead, if I take the time and research, who else is saying on? I can feel something's wrong. I'm like, this isn't right. But mm-hmm. why? And I give the sources why. And I give why I think that's right and support it. All of a sudden, there's like this new – I did literary devices on my most recent beta read. Mm-hmm. And I knew of literary devices. Um, I didn't know of all of them because there's so many. But like I knew the concept. And I knew there was like a repetition thing going on within the story. And it wasn't like a – 
it wasn't the same words going on, but there was a lot of rep. And I'm like, why do I feel like that? And so I started researching literary devices and I found out there's like several different literary devices about repetition. Mm -hmm. And the author was stacking up several of those devices together. So it felt very repetitive writing it or reading it. And I'm like, ah, you're using three different styles of the same device. And I'm like, just skimming trying to get to the next point because we're, we're, we've done this. Yeah. And I was able to explain why, and I was able to say exactly what the devices were. Um, and then I understood, and I found devices that I wanted to start using from that Me, research. You learned writing. something new. That's the yeah. best. Um, and that's – I can't even count how many times when I'm doing – critiques or beta rate and I'm looking at the whole because I'm always looking at the whole picture I'm like okay what Mm -hmm. is the author trying to do what genre are they in I always make sure I know the genre they're in and I'm a reader in it and if I'm not that means I must really love the author and I'm doing them a big favor because it's gonna be tons of research for me because now I have to go research the genre and the tropes and the expectations Mm -hmm. because I'm not I'm going to be in line with what the goal is of the piece yeah and so I try and look at that and I sit down and learn so much about my own writing in it yes half the time i'll see something they're doing i'm like oh i do this too and yeah. then my workup will be like hey what if we did this so that it becomes a we like i need to fix this problem too yes and that's a great relationship with a critique partner too it is that that starts to become that's that's when you start molding your tribe that's when you start meeting your people is when you match in your critiques and when you start realizing how helpful somebody is in very certain aspects because you might lack those and they might lack something that you're able to bring to the table um you know they might not be very good at at like logic points like they might say that they're going you know down the stairs when you know they're going up the stairs and you know you're like no no wait they weren't going down they're going up so you point out and you're being like I think they're going up here and they're like oh god they are going up I can't believe I did that and it's just like well yeah because you've looked at these works so many times that you start your brain starts filling in words that you think are there and actually, you would say something different. And there's only so many times you can look at your work before everything just starts smearing itself together. Well, and you start reading what is in your head versus what's yes, on the paper. Exactly. Like you think that it's going to say this and you didn't realize that you literally missed two words in your sentence. And somebody's going to read that and go, wait. And they're going to reread it again. They're say, you're missing a two and an A here. <laughs> it's like, I have oh. two years that for me all the time. It's so dang helpful. Yeah, I'm like it, ah. that is helpful. <laughs> How did I not see that? Oh, right? I get that a lot in critiques. I'm like, oh, that's so obvious. How did I miss that? But when you're reading the same <sighs> stuff and you've changed it so many times, there's so many obvious things. Obvious, you know, the right there to yes. use, and yes. you're gonna mess it up sometimes. It just you happens. Are. You're going to talk about their eye color 14 times. No, I'm not talking about myself. I don't know what you're talking about there. And then you realize and somebody's like, this is a little repetitive. And you go, a little? Yeah, it's a little repetitive there, Poppy. Way to go. I mean, random person, not me. Yeah, it's just so, you know, you just don't think about it as you're putting words down. And then once you're trying to get everything together and you're doing stuff chapter by chapter when you're editing, you sometimes forget what you did three chapters ago and what you mentioned. And so it's really good when somebody's like Cassandra and doing a beta read and is going through the entire thing and reading it in, you know, over a couple days or whatever they're, and they're like, wait, like you mentioned this in three chapters ago. And you're like, Oh, I did mention that three chapters ago. And repetitive words, words that you stick to. I can't tell you when I first started writing, Actually, it's probably embarrassing, and I should probably go actually look up my first drafts. I bet you I had sigh in my first book like 800 times, like truly. (laughs) I still am trying to get out sighs and grins. Yes. I'm still trying. It's hard, and that's that's what brings your writing to new levels is when you have people sit down and they go, okay, we get that they sigh a lot. I get it. That is totally get it because they did it six times in this chapter and it's like ooh, <laughs> oops and then Oopsie. you need to figure out how to get rid of those and what else can you use and then you start light bulbing so much as to like oh how can i like, well, what are they really feeling behind a sigh you know and this is stuff that when you get critiques you you don't realize until somebody else points it out and you're like okay i need to step up and i need to like 
And edit, I think it's those. almost like there's stages of getting a critique. Yeah. So the first, so I like, because Poppy kind of went through the stages there. So you get the critique and it's like, oh, man, it, it stings, you know? It's like it your baby and your love and it hurts a little bit when, um, especially if there's a critique where they find more that they don't like than they do. Yeah. And that's going to happen. And um, it stings. But then there's like, stick with it, look at it, let it sit for a little bit, and you go through stages, and then it's like a, okay, well, let's look at this then. Mm -hmm. How do we fix this? There's like an acceptance of it. Right. Right? And then Mm -hmm. there's that beautiful, glorious stage of a light bulb moment where, sure, maybe it's not what they, how they told you to fix it, but you find a way that just blows open a character trait, a plot hole, a... It fixes something bigger with that one little problem because you sat on it and looked at different ways to go at it, different ways to approach it. You changed your perspective on how you were running it because there was a problem in it. Yeah. And that's where it's so worth it for critiques. It is. It even is. if it hurts a little bit, it's so worth it. I mean, there have been times where I have literally – I've been pissed over a critique before. There have been times where I've just been like – I am hashtag insulted. I can't believe that they would say that about my characters. And then like a couple of days later, I reread it and I'm like, crap, they were right. Crap. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, you think about it and it's like, they weren't entirely right, but they were a little right. And I could see, you know, I, I sat on it and I thought and I took a break and I looked at it again and I went, okay, I can see how that perception would be there. Um, And then there's other things where I'm like, yeah, this, no, this doesn't pertain to me at all. I think it's just a matter of getting multiple critiques. Don't get a critique and think that that's it. Like, Ooh, there's a rule for that. Poppy, tell us the rule. Oh, the, (laughs) I love the rule of threes. Okay. So when I first started out, I, I was, it's, it's very difficult sometimes when you're first starting out receiving critiques as to, Okay what is good what is bad what makes sense what doesn't you know why is this person telling me that this character is a jerk um these other people think that they're amazing Um, oh you're gonna get so much contradiction you're gonna contradicting feedback much contradicting feedback and so (sighs) what happens is i end up getting i usually i i aim for five or six critiques per whatever Um, that's what I aim for because it ends up being, you get a better idea when you get all of them as to what's not working and what is. So don't touch the piece after one, two or three critiques. Let it sit. Let it sit because if you, you'll get excited and you'll get your first critique and you're like, okay, okay, okay. I need to go change this. And then you change it. And then the next two people are like, oh my God, I love that part. And you're like, I just deleted it and redid it. You know, so you need to put your stuff out there for critique. Try to get more than, you know, So how does this come back to rule of three? It comes back to the rule of three as if you, if one person doesn't like your work or doesn't like something about your work or tells you that you've done something wrong, wait, just sit on it and be like, okay, mm, I'm going to think on that. If two people tell you that something is incorrect. The exact same something. The exact same something is incorrect. You need to really look at it. You need to really super duper look at it because there is something wrong there. If three people tell you, you need to fix it. If three people tell you that something is one very specific thing is wrong, it means that it is very wrong and you need to go and fix that thing because that is clearly not working. Um, That's pretty much the rule of three there. It's like one, all right, two, mm, three, ooh. That's where you go. And so fixing a problem doesn't also mean like going in and deleting and getting rid of it. Sometimes right. there's so many things that could happen and go wrong. Um, like I was saying earlier, you could need to give more information before that scene so that it makes sense. It could be looking at it in a different angle. Um, where it's at in the scene, maybe the information needs to be somewhere else. Or having more internal dialogue was always a big thing when I was first starting out is my character would do something and no one would understand why they were doing something. And it's because I had in my head what they were doing, but I didn't express it on the paper. And in their POV, you need to like tell what's going on. Like, why are they doing this? And that was a big one for me. I mean, sometimes you just need more explanation as to why your character is doing something. Inner dialogue is huge. Um, I think both of us tend to write 
third and then poppy does first a lot too she's pretty mm-hmm. half, I and switch half back and forth third and first yeah. um i'm third person true and steady yeah. um i there are times when you're not going to do tons of internal dialogue mm-hmm. um depending on your point of view and what you're writing from and in that case i think uh actions that's like the what's the actions mean more than words it's like the old catchphrase. I like it's that. It's the same thing with your characters. Um, it's not just what they say, and it's not just their inner dialogue. We also have what they are physically, actively doing besides sighing and grinning. And <laughs> yes. these things can tell a lot about how they're feeling, about how they feel about other characters, about all mm-hmm. sorts of stuff. And it's really smart when you're looking at trying to express a character that you look at all three of these equally their outer dialogue their inner dialogue and their physical action there should be an equal part in all three of those i like that and sometimes you're lacking one and somebody will tell you well this isn't working for me this is and i think probably the most helpful critiques for me are sometimes the first reads and people go through and they go oh my god i love that like oh yay i'm so glad that you love that one part because i really love that one part too and they'll be like I don't know what this means. He's being really mean here. And you look at it again, you go, he is? And you're like, oh, I could see how they would think that he's being mean here because of this particular reason, because I forgot that backstory part where he's afraid of blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that is where critiques are really just shining stars for me is when people give me these first reaction stuff. Um, And it can be anybody. And I think that is really hard sometimes when you're first starting out. Um, Cass knows, um, I've had to take critique breaks before because I get, I get critique anxiety because it, I get overloaded. I want to do absolutely everything and I will spend like hours and hours on a chapter. Um, and I get really overwhelmed and I overwhelm the person I'm critiquing and I have to stop. (laughs) It's like just too much. And it can be very difficult when you're first starting out to say, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say here. Like I'm, uh, how... I'm starting out too. I don't know anything yet. Like, what do I do? Well, do you read books? I mean, obviously, if you're writing, you've probably read books because you enjoy reading. That's my guess here. Maybe it's an assumption. Um, but that It better not be an assumption. If it is, go get your <laughs> if ass it is, into a book you need right to go now. read. <laughs> yes. If it is, you know, go. Um, <laughs> read more. Uh, but, you know... Look at it as a reader. I mean, you're reading. Yes, you might be new. Yes, you might not know everything. You might not know that you weren't using conjunctions or POV. But how did it make you feel? And some of those, um, I've had really amazing first-time critiquers critique my stuff because they're just reading it. They're like, oh, wow, like I really... I really liked this part. It made me laugh out loud. Like sometimes that is the most helpful things for me because I'm like, I'm so glad that hit home because I was really trying to make that hit home or they might be like, ah, yeah, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense to me. And I go, ah, it's because I, I flipped my sentence. I didn't do it right. Um, because you read. And so, you know, like what works for you and what doesn't is it's really okay as a first time critique. And it's okay as well. If you're critiquing somebody you don't know, and it's one of your first critiques to say, hi, I'm here. I read a lot of this genre. Um, I, this is my first critique. Uh, please let me know if you need more after it or whatever, you know, and go through like that. And not just first-time critiquers. When I go in and critique, um, I have a set uh, tribe. So I don't, I'm don't. i not generally going out and doing new critiques as mm-hmm. of right now. But I will again, and I have tons of times before. And I have a disclaimer like that. It doesn't say, hey, I'm a new critiquer. But it says, hey, this is the style of critiquer I am. And it says, hey, so I'm not going to go in here. I, even if I see like a spag issue, a spelling, punctuation, and grammar issue, I'm not going to flag it. I don't pay attention to it. I am not like Poppy where I sit down for hours and tell you every single thing that's going on. Mm -hmm. That's just not how it's going to work for me. Um, I don't have time to do that, one. And two, go pay a copy editor because I don't have the credential to do it. So I'm not going to – I'm more fearful of leading you in the wrong direction because what I think might be right may not in that scenario. But – I am going to sit down, look at your piece, and I am going to go over pacing with you. I'm going to go over, if you have a magic system, what makes sense for me, and character development character arcs. Those are like my three golden things that I will dig in for you. 
I will not tell you how to do it properly because it's writing. There is no right or wrong, however you're doing it. But I'll look at what you're trying to do, and I'll tell you what I got from it. So those are the things I focus on. And so if I get to the end of a critique and I'm like, there's not consistency in the magic system. Mm -hmm. They're breaking rules that they've set up or they're not setting up any rules or they're inconsistent in how they use the magic, what the magic does. So instead of just saying that, I'll go back through the piece and I'll flag every time they use magic. And I'll be like, okay, so here you've used it and you've set up this rule by doing it this way. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, now down here, you've broken the rule that you set up here, and here's how. And now down here, so I'll flag each area in there that's giving me that inconsistency instead of just saying it's inconsistent. really helpful. That's that's super helpful because if it's a book that is fantasy and involves magic, I mean, Cass is a fantasy writer. She has read a ton of magic system books, and she knows these things. And so that's going to be really helpful because if she's caught it, you know that readers are going to catch it too because readers really do genre read. And if you are in a very specific genre and you're catching the eye, if you're in sci-fi and you have really loose, inconsistent details on technology, your sci-fi people are going to be like, what is this? Like, well, how does that work? It doesn't make sense that this doesn't work this way. I need like a map, like give, give me, give me, give me. Um, and a lot so. of times if you get a critiquer who is like specific, there's, and there's, it's not just fantasy or just sci-fi, right? So there's different types in each. Yes. And so even though I like specific types of fantasy, I'm aware of the other types and their tropes because I've read so much in the genre. So I can be like, okay, not my favorite brand of fantasy, but I know this brand and I know what they're trying to do. So, okay, cool. And I can go with it. And and that's when it comes back to also when we're talking about finding critique partners. And they don't have to be like – I don't have to have only dark fantasy authors critique my stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, my critique tribe that I have, I think there's one other dark fantasy. There's ten of them. Mm-hmm. I've got – for some reason, I have a buttload of romance writer friends. <laughs> romance people love your stuff. I really it's do. so good. It's because you're but, character-oriented. We just love those characters. <laughs> but the thing is, is most of these romance writers who are my critique buddies aren't just romance readers. They also yeah. read other genres. That so a good critique partner doesn't have to be a writer of the genre, but they have to have read it and be familiar with the genre as far as the expectations of it. Yeah. So that's why, and I said earlier, writer or reader. Um, and so a lot of people will peg me as someone who's like, oh, Cass is like a horror, dark fantasy writer. She can't critique romance. Oh, Guys, I like gobble up romance books. Yes. I read paranormal romance. I read contemporary romance. I read fantasy romance. Mm-hmm. I love romance. Yeah. So I can critique it. I do know how it's supposed to go, the flow of it, the feel of it, the characters, yeah. But I don't write it. So uh, – and that's one of those things too where uh, I think it's pretty invasive to be like, before you critique my stuff, you better tell me what type of reader you are. We can't do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can't do that. But you can ask for what you're pr- – like if there's something that you are concerned with. Um, like if – like for me, because I'm a romance writer, I want to make sure that my uh, my romance arcs are happening. And so I will put notes in there to be like – hey, does this make sense for these two? Are you getting the feels for them? Like, does it make sense? Is he coming off as a jerk? You know, um, is, is how is this working out? Uh, so I want stuff like that. And I will make notes for people just so that they can be aware that this is what I'm looking for. But I'm not going to be like, oh, you're a horror writer? Well, you are not going to be able to do this <laughs> because Cass and I, uh, we critique each other's stuff and we fit great. So, but we do not write the same genre. Uh, But we overlap and we understand certain things. Uh, So just because somebody's out of genre doesn't mean that they won't be able to critique you. But it is certainly helpful to have critiques in your genre. So which brings – she said something great about what she's looking for. So I was talking about a critiquer. I'll go in and say what kind of critiquer I am. And um, just to feedback real quick, you can't always up front say – okay, I only want people who read this genre. That's just something you find out as you develop a relationship. Yeah. Um, And you start critiquing back and forth and you start seeing what they're familiar with in their tropes. And you can tell too because they'll start comparing parts of your magic system to other 
magic systems in other books. So you're like, mm-hmm. oh, they know their magic systems. Um, but there's also the other thing that Poppy was talking about where you can put in the beginning of a work what you're looking for in a critique. Yeah. This is not tacky. There's nothing wrong with doing this. It's actually beautiful for a critiquer to see that. They're like, oh, they want me. And it's one of the things I always ask someone, what do you want me to look for specifically? Yeah. I, I will look at other things too. And if something else jumps out at me, of course, I'll flag that as well. But is there something specific you want me to check in here and look for? Right. So Poppy says she a lot of times she'll look for um, romance uh, beats and arcs and if it's the emotions that you're getting from the romantic couple. Mm-hmm. I have problems. I have very unlikable characters. <laughs> and so I always have to do like a check of is my character likable? Right. Um, that sounds awful. I don't think that's true, but, <laughs> but I, I true. get it. I think it's because of uh, your first drafts and internal um, internal stuff. Well, I like, always we don't have, know sometimes. No one likes my pro tag and everyone loves my antagonist is usually what happens. Or I have like a lot of characters that are half pro tag, half antag. They're like this muddy gray. Right. And my readers just, whew, they attach to those like nothing else. But my pro tags, I always have a female point of view pro tag. I'm a woman. I like to write women. Mm-hmm. And um, they oftentimes in my first drafts are not likable. They're like, man, she's a little snatch. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, she is. You would be too if you were in her situation. But, but... we don't know that yet. Yeah. So you have to, you have to <laughs> latch on. Kind of, yeah, I get that completely. And it's okay as well to tell people um, what draft you're in. I mean, because some people oh, like yeah, critiques from idea. your first draft. And at that point, you need to be like, look, I know that I probably have a thousand misspellings in this. But what I really need to know is if this is hitting home for, you know, if this almost death scene is, is leading up and if it's if it's hitting home um you know or it could be like guys this is my final draft i am not changing my arc okay so you know but i would really like to know if i'm misspelling stuff or having repeats um i feel like i i'm there's something wrong with this particular scene it's okay to say things like that too and like we'll have people in our group who are like hey i'm about to send this out to an agent who requested it can you do a good look over it and see if there's any typos Yes. You know, they're about, they're about to send it out to an agent who's requested it. They're not going to want to know their pacing and their character development. and their... They're not going to change their arcs. Right. Nope. So I'm just looking for any typos that catch my eye because that's what they need. Yeah. Um, and that's when you have a critique partnership like that, sometimes you do what they need. That's yeah. fine. And that saves time, too, because that means that I'm not going to be focusing on this. And for me, who focuses on absolutely everything, that really, really <laughs> helps. Because otherwise, it would be a couple days where they might want to send it in the afternoon. I'm going to be like, it's going to take me like four days, you know, and they don't want to get back this Christmas tree work on their first chapter. Um, they want to make sure that it is smooth and, you know, whatever. And that brings it back to an interesting point if it's to the point where it is at a final draft for them and Poppy can see that how she would tackle it it's a christmas tree by the end and they're like no this is a final draft and that goes to talk about how all writers approach things differently yes and well and when you ask somebody to crit they're looking for problems and they're looking for things that they might consider be a problem but it's not a problem um and it's style and there's so many different others you know different ways that we can approach and different ways that we all write different things to look for um yeah yep so and it's that balance. You're going to be dealing with that balance all the time of sit and listen on the advice they've given and see if there's truth to it. Give it a couple mm-hmm. days to sink in. Um, if Even if and if several people have marking something rule of threes, then you're going to have to find a way to make it better. Even if you have to have that point, there's a better way to show it, do it, use it, however you need to do. Yeah. Um, now, this goes into critiquing as well. So there's a middle ground. You can go in and you can – like just light it up like a Christmas tree in a negative way. There's a positive way. Like Poppy's very yes. aware of the author and what they're trying to do. I'm going to give as many good things as I am bad when I'm critiquing. Yeah. So you have to, first of all, don't go in with a critique looking at how you would write it. Mm-hmm. Go in looking at it like, because you don't do that perspective when you're reading a book, right? When you pick up a book to read. Yeah, you just read it. Yeah. So read it for the enjoyment of a good story. If you can't get into it, start looking at why. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always, too, so if I'm – I try to pay attention to how many, like, how 
comfortable the person is with crits. Like if it's uh, – most sites will tell you if it's a new person, True. how much experience they have there. And if it's someone that really hasn't had a lot of critiques or is newer to writing, I always like to do the um, compliment sandwich. Yes. Where I give something good, then I give something they need to work on, and then I end it with something good. There's something good in every piece of writing. If you're going to critique a piece of writing and you can't find something good in it, don't critique it. That's you're not connecting with the piece. It's not working for you. Don't do it. Um, there is something good. You do want to encourage the other writer. And so, yeah, you can list. So and then if it's someone more established, so I don't worry about like if I'm critiquing poppy stuff, I don't worry about giving her a compliment sandwich. Um, but I love her style and her writing. So I'm going to see just as many things as I love is that I don't usually there's it's mostly love. And then there's a couple things I'm like, oh, mm, this hit me wrong. Or uh, it was a little choppy, your flow and transition here. This transition didn't work for me. Um, and so, but there's positive. You have to put the positive in and you have to realize there are different styles. This isn't you telling the story. This is you listening to a story. Yes. And then giving how the story impacted you. And if it right. didn't impact you. That's okay. That's good feedback too. But if there's potential places where it could have impacted you, point them out. Why it fumbled. Where you were like, ah, I was kind of excited here and then all of a sudden I was super excited for this information or I couldn't wait for this character's reaction. And then you moved on and I didn't yeah. get it. Yeah. It's all about how you feel about the story, how it impacts you. That is golden information. For an Gosh, that's get golden information on a crit. Yep. What other I advice would you give for how to give a good critique? I mean, you definitely want to be complimentary as well. Um, it, those critiques, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the, you know, writing, how many books you've done. When somebody comes in and they're like, I don't like this. I don't like this. You need to change this. I don't like this. I don't like this. It sucks and it hurts and it like punches you in the gut when it's like, but this was my final chapter in my favorite book and you just told me that it sucked. But they didn't tell you it sucked. They just saw little pieces of it that, you know, they could have been better, but they didn't say anything nice at all. That's really, really difficult. I'm not saying sugarcoat stuff. I'm not saying, you know, be a sunshine buttercup that's just spreading, meant to be spreading joy. You you need critiques. You need to be honest. But it is the honesty of it. What You have to have liked something. Like, what did you like? And Make sure that they know that this was a really strong piece, but there were these things that didn't work or that, you know, the concept was phenomenal and really drew you in. Or even but, if it wasn't a strong piece, that it has yeah. potential to be. Yes, that this is like, oh, man, like this is this is going to be great. I know that you're working hard on this and, and I can tell or you, you've really improved since the last time that I've read something from you and oh my gosh like I love that you've done this with this piece and because sometimes you will re-critique certain people um if you start finding your your tribe and your people um so you know be kind be understanding uh that's a a big thing be empathetic toward people you're a writer too and it doesn't feel nice um but sometimes some writers are would prefer people to just stop and just tell it how it is um, or how they think it is. And they're ready for the negative. And they're ready for you to, to punch them in the gut. Uh, those don't typically match very well with with me, not because I can't take it, but because I'm like, but I'm going to gush a little and I'm going to go through and I'm going to tell you my first reactions. And if you're bored because, you know, my first reactions are, oh my gosh, this made me laugh. I really love this character. I love the description you used for this. I really see it well. Wow, this was like a cin cinematic scene. I just, you know, blew my way. If you can't take those parts, I'm not your person. So it's just a matter of like finding the correct critique partner and finding a group that, that you can trust to give it to you straight. Um, don't just make everything complimentary even either. What's the point in a critique if everything is, I love this, it's perfect, it's great, I love it. Um, and don't compare your work to their work to your own. I've gotten several critiques where people have been like, oh my gosh, we do this similarly. Uh, there's a scene in my book where this guy does this and it's so close. Have you read my work? Don't do that. You know, I mean, yes, you want them to critique your stuff too, but then it just makes you seem like you really don't care about their work and all you want to do is talk about your own. And then it's like you're not likely to forge a good a good relationship when you start out that way. And I think too, as I was thinking about it as you were talking about, I mean compliments for sure, but I was thinking of ways that I – because I've been a bad critiquer sometimes. 
And I'm trying to think of what made me a bad critiquer and why. And I think as I was first going out and learning and as I would get a new concept or a new understanding about writing, I'd be so excited to like share it with everyone. Yes. But then like I didn't step back and look at Some authors break some rules on purpose. Some authors don't use some devices or some styles on purpose. And if I've just learned this new device or this new rule or this new thing, I'm like, oh, 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 you're totally doing this wrong. You're supposed to do it like this. And I get so excited. But it's not how their style is and what their story is. I've done that several times. And then I'll get really excited. And I thought a good critique meant that I was just breaking down everything I could find. And it wasn't. It was almost like I was trying to be like a teacher, an authority figure and teaching them everything I knew. Um, And it just came off as bossy and trying to write their stuff for them. I am so guilty of that or have been. I've really had to step back. And I think a lot of times that's why I will, okay, if this didn't work, I need to go find articles to say what's going on about that and give sources for that instead of me trying to be a teacher. Because I just, I don't have the authority to do that. I'm here with you. I'm trying to have a relationship back and forth if I'm critiquing your stuff. And I really had to put myself in check a couple times. Well, and for critiques, I mean, when you're in the critiquing stage and when you're, you're all sort of learning together. I mean, it's not going to be, you're not going to have a a best-selling author walk into a critique site and and critique your work most likely. I mean, they maybe they're sneaky and they totally wanted to do that. And that's cool. (laughs) I wouldn't count on it though. But I wouldn't count on it. For the most part, you're all learning together. And so oftentimes it's like teenagers teaching teenagers sometimes. And and you're all learning together at best. And sometimes you're all learning together so take everything with a grain of salt and also try to be kind and try to try and to realize what you're doing and don't spread misinformation just because real quick, you think the teenagers teaching teenagers isn't a reference to your age it's no. your level of understanding in writing so yeah. like you go through it's you're not a middle school or you're a teenager but you're still not like in the adult world of writing you're right. still in the right before learning yes. and we're all in that teenager versus teenager Yes. You're going to school as often as you can. You're trying to figure it all out. Some people know really good in science and some people are really good in math and it doesn't always match. Um, But you don't know who those people are sometimes. And it just takes a level of trust and understanding and trying to figure out what the heck everybody's all about and what works for you and what doesn't. Um, But you can find some amazing friends and some amazing people with critiques. I mean, you really, really can. You can also find people that you want to avoid. And it's just, uh, you know, um, some people get you, some people don't. And that's really a good start of a tribe is starting to critique and doing it at a stage that's not going to, to kill you. <laughs> you know, you don't want to do it at a stage where you're like, I've written three chapters of the best things ever. And you put them out there and people rip them apart. And you're like, I'll never write again. Or, um, you know, especially when you're first starting out, I would highly recommend getting your work completely done before you put it out for critique. So um, few people do that. And I know most so of you are people. actually not going to take that advice. Um, but getting the whole picture out of what you're trying to go and do yeah, is because it can be very everything. disheartening and not just can you have the chance of not finishing your work because you think people don't like it, but you can also get really, really stuck into what other people want you to do and where you think they want you to lead the story. And then you've lost your creative process. You've lost um, the vision of your story. You lost the vision of your story. You thought it would end this way, but then you realize that they don't like this person. They think he's a villain. So, okay, well, I guess I'll make him into a villain, but he wasn't supposed to be that way. Um, and you're just not to that point yet. And you haven't written that part that it can really stall everything that you've been trying to do. And that can really hurt you. So just highly recommended from past experiences, get your work completely done before you start putting it out for critique. Um, don't just pop in. And then some people also will jump into like random chapters and that can be rough too. Cause they're like, I don't understand what's going on here. It's like, cause you didn't read the first six chapters. And so it's just being able to have a full piece of work to under, to, to deliver and to get people to look at, um, is good. It's I, yeah, I didn't take that advice when I started out, but now that I've been there for a while, I highly recommend it. It's hard though. Cause you just want to share. You get excited. Yeah. You know, you get excited. You're like, I'm starting to write. And I just found on these other sites, um, you can do sites in person. You can do sites uh, virtually online. uh, You can meet all kinds of people because the more that you realize you're a writer, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> go back to like our, our first episode. If you haven't just shouted to the world yet that you're a writer, uh, go do that and then realize that you're a writer. And when you do, you're going to find out so many people that are also writers. Uh, there are so many. It is amazing. I have, I, I had a uh, like I went out and hung out at a friend's house one day and I was like I was so excited because I had just finished my my first book and I mean it was a dumpster fire but I had finished it and I was so excited about it and I was like should I tell them should I should I should I tell them and so I like snuck away with my friend and was like guess what they were like what and I was like I wrote a book and they're like you're kidding and I was like what and they're like I wrote a book too. And I'm like, shut the front door. And it was just like this amazing moment of, oh my God, you wrote a book too. And we were in the same genre. It was just like the wackiest, weirdest thing. You just, all these, all of a sudden everybody's a writer and you realize that you're not alone in this world. And then you start reading each other's stuff and bouncing ideas off each other. And then you end up with the tribe. So start getting out and talking to people, start admitting that you're a writer and get your stuff complete and ready for people to look at it. And it's going to hurt a little bit. It's going to sting. I mean, it really is be prepared for it because no matter what you put your work out there and you want people to love it, you want people to tell you that there's nothing wrong with it and it's absolutely beautiful and glorious and you should publish it today. They're not going to do that. They're looking for problems. They're looking for issues. You're going to have problems and issues. It's just, it's, it's never ending. It's never perfect. Perfect is not a, a term I ever use in really anything because perfection doesn't, for me, doesn't really exist. There's no such thing that is this ideal, amazing state because it's art. Some people are going to love it. Some people are not. That's okay. But you're going to do the best that you possibly can. And critique is a huge part of that. So we're going to wrap up here because we're getting kind of long. Um, but we want to kind of make sure you approach being a critiquer as a reader. Make sure that you give love with your critiques, but you give honesty. It's okay to give a disclaimer of what kind of critiquer you are. It's okay to give a disclaimer of what kind of critiques you want. And we have a challenge for you about that that we want you to go out and do. And our challenge this week to go out to social media, hashtag us punch keys, and uh, we challenge you to put out in the world what your dream critique to receive is as a horror writer, romance writer, whatever you are. As a... Blah, 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 genre writer, my dream critique is, and don't try to make it snort and short and snappy because, you know, it's social media and our attention span is so long on social media. Um, don't go over three, maybe pick three bullet point things that just would be awesome that you want. If you have one, that's fine, but don't go over three, your dream critiques and put it out there in the world and then just being able to say that out loud maybe will give you a better idea when you're going and finding critique partners what you're looking for, uh, which will help you narrow the field. Yay! Get that work Got done. This. Get it ready. Do it, do it, do it. Go punch those keys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. And if you liked this episode, please subscribe and give us that clickable five-star love. Got writer questions or feedback? Reach out through our website. And until next time, make sure to punch the keys.